Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever it is that you are, wherever you may be. Thank you very much for making us a part of your day. I am Brad Franklin, the creative content writer here in Chesterfield, and I'm very glad to tell you that Chesterfield Behind the Mic is on the air once again. Now, a few weeks ago, we brought you an episode of the show with Deputy County Administrator Matt Harris to walk through what a bond referendum was and, and how it worked, uh, a bond referendum 101, if you will. And we promised you in that episode that we'd come back to the bond referendum soon to break down some of the various projects. Well, folks, this is that show. Now, before we get started, I want to set the table here. This fall, Chesterfield residents are going to go to the polls to vote for the Community Facilities Bond Plan, which will authorize the issuance of $540 million in general obligation bonds. Now, if approved, it would fund 26 different capital improvement projects over the next 8 to 10 years that were split among four categories, schools, public safety, libraries, and parks. We're going to go through all of those different projects today during this episode, but please visit Chesterfield.gov slash bond for more information on what is being presented on, on the ballot. Um, Now, it's important that we make note here that our job today is merely to share the information about the projects that are included in this plan. Actually, by law, that's all we can do. We cannot advocate or voice opinions. So what you're going to hear today as I talk to our guests about the projects is the information about them, the costs associated, that kind of thing. As Joe Friday might say, just the facts, ma'am. We're now joined by Dr. Merv Doherty from uh, Chesterfield County Public Schools. Dr. Doherty, how are you? I'm fantastic. Thanks for having me. Yes, sir. Glad for you to be here. Uh, happy to, to finally get a chance to sort of, as I said, talk through these different projects and, and kind of get a sense of what is kind of in this community facilities bond plan. I guess the place I want to start first is these uh, the first two elementary schools, um, A.M. Davis in Manchester and Bensley, um, replacing, replacing those schools. What went into, well, or sort of what's the background on, on why that that is part of the plan to replace those two elementary schools well first of all uh, you know people talk about to remodel or to replace right and a, re- a remodel will last you 10 to 15 years right. a replacement's gonna last you 50 to 60. right so financially sound mm-hmm. to rebuild mm-hmm. bensley and davis are both very old schools right that are undersized for their populations right and uh, we think that uh, by looking at the two schools that uh, the rebuilds for both Bensley and Davis will benefit the educational environment of the students. Right. And I'm a firm believer that our students should have a fantastic place to go to school, great learning environments and safe environments. Right. And both schools are in need of replacement Mm -hmm. just because of the age of the building. Right. And in capacity wise, I think it's what, 900? 900. That you can get Just because of the growth and all of our elementaries will go to 900. This is a great opportunity to expand to, uh, the expansion not only benefits students, it benefits the community. Right. Our communities use our facilities all the time. Right. From the gym space to the cafeteria space, right. gym, uh, auditorium, meeting areas, right. rooms. So it benefits everyone in the community in that area mm-hmm. to uh, see a, a new facility go up. Right. Now, in the Western 360 area, you mentioned growth. Obviously, you know, that is a, that's been a, a place where there's, we've seen a lot of that in the county. And the plan calls for the uh, construction of two new schools, a new elementary school and a new high school. I believe this would be the county's first new high school since Cosby in 2006, if I'm not Absolute, mistaken. Absolutely. But I'm just curious, what, is it just growth that's driving the need for those two schools? Is that the primary driver? We, we are one of the few school divisions, not only in Virginia, but in the country, that are seeing this rapid growth. Mm-hmm. Uh, we are excited that people want to move to Churchfield, great place to live, mm-hmm. uh, fantastic school system. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, so we're seeing it not just from Northern Virginia, but from around the country right. as we talk to realtors. Uh, the growth is uh, moving at a rapid pace. Right. I think the opportunity to place a high, new high school mm-hmm. is needed. Uh, tremendously. By mm-hmm. the time we build it, we will definitely see the overcrowding. Right. And in the uh, elementary school as well, right. just if uh, you go out to that area, upper Magnolia area, mm-hmm. you can see the growth that's occurring. Right. And that will be a school of 900 students as well. Right. Now, the third uh, question I want to talk to you about, or this, the, I guess the next portion of our discussion is about Grange. Um, obviously, that's a an elementary school that we're talking about re- in this plan replacing. And I'm just curious, what was what's the, the thought process in that decision to replace that school as well? There are several uh, points uh, that we had to look at. One, the school is 100 years old. Right. It's been piecemealed together over time. Right. Uh, so it's more of a maze when you go around. <laughs> Right. Uh, where the building sets is also uh, a concern for us because it sits right up on the road. Okay. So it's, it's, it causes uh, difficulty for busing, for traffic in and out of the school. Right. 
Uh, and uh, with uh, the growth that's occurring and the space that's needed, mm-hmm. a, a new Grange Hall would be beneficial. 900 students. Right. Again, as that growth continues to move out uh, uh, west on 360. Right. right. But the uh, the facility itself uh, has no beneficial mm. opportunities for us to uh, to right. remodel. It right. needs to be rebuilt. Gotcha. Now the other, the I guess the other part for the the high school piece of this is uh, expanding Thomas Dale. Um, I, I know that right now those kids are currently split between two campuses. Um, just talk to me a little bit about sort of what the the thought process was in being able to expand there and kind of bring some some cohesion to to that campus. Yes, uh, with the uh, the ninth graders over at the West Campus, uh, one it, it does set up a ninth grade academy. However, right. it keeps a separation and there are sometimes programs can't be utilized from one building to the next because right. of staffing issues. Right. By bringing the campus into one building, uh, it allows the entire student body to be together. It mm-hmm. allows different programming to occur for our ninth graders as mm-hmm. well as, as everyone else in the, in the building. Uh, this expansion, uh, which would go in the back part of the school, would mm-hmm. is a perfect place uh, for this. It's still to be a ninth grade wing, mm-hmm. ninth grade academy area, but also allows for some outside the box thinking of how we can use the West Campus for right. additional growth as we move forward. Right. And last question, um, Midlothian Middle School. This one's a little bit different because it's not just the age of facility, but also like where it is actually located. Um, this plan would call for um, replacing that middle school. And I'm just curious what, what the thought process was behind that decision as well. Well, if anyone who's had a middle school student at Midlothian Middle would agree that traffic there yeah. <laughs> is not only impossible but dangerous. Yeah. Uh, you know, when a school was built over 100 years ago, you didn't have the traffic Correct. on the turnpike. Right. And with the growth that's occurring and the age of the school, right? Uh, I don't think anyone disagrees that uh, this building needs to be replaced. Right. No, there's a lot of history there, and right. uh, but uh, we'll promise to take some bricks over with us <laughs> to the building. But uh, the growth of the building uh, to expand the uh, the capacity of the building is, right. is needed. Right. There is no doubt that the this area of the county is growing rapidly as well, mm-hmm. and we want to be prepared for the next decade that occurs. Right. And I would imagine too, just the you know the the that when you're not only able to replace an aging facility, one that has you know been you know nearly a century old, and the traffic piece of it, it it, it certainly makes sense as to why that was chosen, why that's on this list. Um, overall, in in terms of that decision um, for for Tom, or excuse me, for Midlothian, um, you, you mentioned that the traffic was a you know, was dangerous. What is that specifically to bus traffic? Is that specifically to kids may potentially walking? What are some of the traffic concerns at Midlothian? Well, the volume on the turnpikes, right? Horrendous at times. Right. And to, uh, try to come into the school or to leave the this facility mm-hmm. is almost impossible at times. I do believe that, uh, a new facility would give us a uh, greater parking, greater mm-hmm. access to car lines. Right. Uh, busing areas and also provide uh, a safer walking path uh, to the school, which we would love to have. Right. But the where the building sits again, it's right on the road. Mm-hmm. Uh, it makes it challenging. It's almost similar to Grange Hall. Right. When you think about, there's really uh, nowhere to go uh, mm-hmm. to to try to come in if you're tr- coming into the building. If uh, you're trying to cross over two lanes, that's that's a challenge, right. and it's impossible to put lights there because of how the lights are already set up for right. traffic below. Right. Well, Dr. Doherty, thank you very much for joining us today. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Appreciate it. We're joined now by Gerard Durkin, who is the Director of Budget and Management here in Chesterfield County. Gerard, how are you? Welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. I'm well. How are you? I'm doing well. I appreciate your your time today. Obviously, we got a lot to to get through. A um, lot of different projects in this uh, bond plan. I, I want to start with libraries. Forty five point seven million dollars of the of the four hundred five hundred forty is um, is targeted for for libraries. There are three projects replacing the um, Enon Library. Um, what 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 sort of went into the decision there? And then if you also, uh, in that process, you want to tell me a little bit more about expanding the um, the Ettrick Library as well. I'm just curious what sort of went in the decision between those two. 
Well, let me start by saying in general, when we approach the CIP as a whole, Mm -hmm. We use our Stratus program, the Strategic Information Sharing. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, we've had Mr. Engel refer to that before as the kind of black box, the big brain. Right. And we use that primarily as a kind of data-driven approach. We look at where the population is growing, where the housing pipeline is coming. And we use that as a kind of guide for where we build these projects. Right. In terms of the libraries, they actually have a nice blend over this bond referendum from a kind of new build, expansion in Reno. Right. Um, For Enon, the simple reason is that you know it's 4100 square feet right it's the smallest library that we have in the county right and we want to you know put money into that mm-hmm. to bring it up to a kind of standard 20,000 square feet which is what we try to approach with all our libraries right that's the main reason for the enon one mm-hmm. um for etric Matoica, it's the it's 8,000 square feet currently We're right. expanding that to 20,000 square right. feet and as you're probably aware, you know, the libraries really stepped up during the pandemic. Yeah, they were. Most libraries, you know, people assume you just go and check about, check back out. They've done a lot more right. on that front. And we've made a heavy investment into right. the library system, um, like kind of voting location, blood drives, even yeah. with during the ice storm as a kind of shelter right. in place. Right. And so the dynamics of the library system and the needs that it um, serves has changed dramatically. And right. that's also a huge factor in what we propose in the bond referendum for the right. libraries to bring them up to that service level, the new service that a lot of citizens expect. Right. And then that kind of speaks to sort of what, why there's also uh, building a new library on Western Hall Street, growth, you know, services. Yeah. Um, I'm guessing that growth is a big reason why that location was chosen as well. Yeah. If you look, I mean, if you look on the map of the county, that part of the county is the last place where things will really be built out. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's a prime site to build a new library with mm-hmm. the population growing out there. Um, so that's primarily a good the main reason that we went mm-hmm. ahead and selected that site location to serve that so that it takes pressures off of the other libraries right about it as well. Right. Now, as we move to parks and recreation, $38.2 and, uh, million dollars, uh, uh, for these five projects, I kind of want to talk a little bit about these five things as sort of a whole, because I feel mm-hmm. like there's a central theme to them. So there's enhancements at River City Sportsplex. There's enhancements to Horner Park. There's a conservation area access. Um, Fallen Creek water access, and then also a James River boat launch. Um, in terms of picking the parks projects, um, you mentioned sort of IDing sort of where the growth and, and activity and, and, you know, sort of what that metrics is. I'm guessing that helped you also as the, as it went into picking these five projects and, and what sort of stood out about them. Well, again, <clears throat> similar to the libraries, the park system over the last couple of years has really been a core All right now. <laughs> It parts has really been a kind of like core place that people have met over the last couple of years. Right, you know, right. people being stuck indoors with the pandemic, being mm-hmm. able to go out to an open space. Right. Um, a lot of it centered around a kind of sports tourism. Right. It's a big thing in central Virginia and we're trying to capitalize on that. And mm-hmm. um, with River City, you know, adding hillside um, seating. Right. More parks. Right. Uh, turf fields, I should say, sorry. Right. Um, and then at Horner Park in particular, out on that western end of the county again, right. a women's softball complex, um, lighted fields, concession stands and events. Right. And then even in conservation area um, development, you know, the parks, I believe the last statistic was over 6 million visits in a given mm. year. Wow. So we proactively look for sites that we will be able to acquire for future park development. Mm-hmm. Obviously, we can't build everything that we want to in a short period of time. Right. But we have two million in this bond referendum for kind of conservation area access at four sites. Mm-hmm. They kind of you know lay the groundwork for future park development, but start to open them up mm-hmm. so that people can start to enjoy those um, scenic amenities. Right. Um, now, the public safety portion of this is kind of split into two halves. We'll talk about fire EMS first. Four different projects totaling $42 million dollars. Replacing the fire and rescue station in Chester, as well as replacing the uh, fire and rescue station in Ettrick. Was that simply just a matter of those facilities just being sort of, you know, end of life old facilities? Was it more about providing for more space for larger trucks? Because I know for fire EMS, sometimes that's a real concern, right? Is that the that the apparatus cannot fit in a certain place. And I'm just curious, what what was the the thinking behind the, those two replacements? Uh, you hit the nail right on the head. Um, Chester was built in 1962. Um, and Ettrick, I believe, is the oldest at 1929. Wow. Um, obviously, you know, a lot has changed since then. <laughs> a little bit. Yeah, um, a little bit. So the modern day apparatus needs a place to be housed. Mm-hmm. Um, there is a nice picture on a referendum slide where you can see where they try to open the door of a truck and it can't fully open all wow. the way. Right. Um, so, yeah, they were adding like fire engines and reserve ambulances mm-hmm. to those stations. But it is primarily a space need. It's not up to the modern day standards that are right. required. Gotcha. And then for the other two projects, Again, it's more about that population growth. Mm-hmm. Um, fire has seen a lot of increased demand for the services. 
and these other two projects are kind of reflected to be able to make sure that they can provide. Right. Um, and now yeah, let's go over to police and 39.1 million in that four different projects. Um, I'm, I'm assuming that these sites that were chosen for new police stations, um, stone, stone bridge, Western hall street, Chester and Westchester. Um, what, what was the, uh, is that primarily growth driven as well? Was that one of the bigger factors in, in choosing those? It's growth, but it's also, um, a lot of the facilities that they use are not up to what the standards of okay. today are. A lot right. of them are actually in old kind of like fast food restaurants and we pay for huh. rentals on those properties. Okay. So we're getting out of leases, which will generate some operating savings for us. Okay. Um, but it's also more about a kind of high visibility presence, especially in the Melodian Turnpike area. Right. Um, the proposal to put one in at the Spring Rock Green development. And then Western Hall Street is in the back end of a shopping centre, which when it was built in about 2005, 2006, only meant to last three to five years until a new one was built. Right. Obviously, that in that time, that hasn't happened. So right. we need to you know, go ahead and do yeah. that if possible. And then the Chester one, um, it's on Route 10, but only really has a kind of single entrance from an access point of view. Okay, I got And you. it shares it with a post office, doctor's office, and fast food restaurant, <laughs> um, which took me by surprise when I learned that. Uh, yeah. And then in Westchester, um, there is no police facility in that route. 288 Road right. Road area, so it's to kind of, you know, again, serve that area as right. well as the kind of increased visibility. And that seems to be a little bit of a theme as you work through these, right, is that it's not just, uh, you know, replacing an old facility as it might be for schools, but it's also addressing whether it's growth, whether it's activity, a little bit of column A, a little column B. Um, overall, in terms of, um, you know, the way this process has worked out, how, how much time went into identifying these different needs, circling them, researching them i'm just curious like the process for people maybe i think it would be helpful for people to sort of get a feel for you know how long this thing has been in the in the oven so to speak sure um i mean it's a continual process um budgeting isn't a once a year exercise it's something right. that we do throughout the year as i said earlier some of these projects have been identified as early as 2005 it's just identifying the means to be able to do them uh, using our strategy program looking at demographic trends housing trends mm -hmm. but it's really a year-round process and we work with the departments. They're the subject matter experts. Mm -hmm. um, we work with them, you know, what are their needs? What is it that they require? And then, you know, my job and the budget office team's job is to go and see how we can make that happen financially. Right. Now, I want to read the, the ballot question to folks. If you're if you're watching the show, you're probably seeing it on the screen right now. If you're listening to it, the ballot question says, shall the county of Chester, Virginia contract a debt and issue its general obligation capital improvement bonds in the maximum amount of $540 million to provide funds to finance various capital pro improvement projects for one, public schools and system purposes, public safety purposes, public library purposes, and parks and recreation purposes. Voting yes on election day signifies approval of the community bond, uh, excuse me, community facilities bond plan. Um, I, I, I know the answer to this question, but I'm going to ask it just in case. Um, how there are no new taxes proposed, no meals tax proposed in this, in this plan. Um, you guys were able to basically do that without that. Um, I'm not sure how you explain this in layman's terms, but I'm just curious how that came to be. That's that, maybe that's the best way to say it. Sure. Um, essentially it boils down to our conservative, strong financial practices. Right. Um, when we go through this capital improvement program, we work with our financial advisor to, you know, how much, debt capacity can we afford to take on. Mm -hmm. We look at that over the kind of eight to 10 year horizon. And, you know, we do this thing where we pay off what we call level principal. Mm -hmm. um, so that's like in a faster decrease in our debt service. Okay. So as the years go by, the existing debt service goes down and we're able to issue the debt and we've structured it in such a way that it brings us back to those, a slight increase in our debt service overall in that eight year period, which is what you want. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, we have a triple, triple A rating with the rating agencies that allows us to borrow at the lowest rate possible. But they also want to see that debt service grow kind of proportionally to our budget. Because right. if it doesn't, it looks as though we're not investing in our community. Right. Good deal. Well, let me uh, let me get some key dates for folks out there who might be interested. September the 23rd is when in-person voting begins. October 17th is your deadline to register or update your existing registration. By 5 p.m. on October 28th, you need to request an absentee ballot by mail. Uh, it's the next day by 5 p.m. to deadline to request an absentee um, ballot in person. November 5th is the last day of in-person early voting, and November the 8th is the election day. You can check out chesterfield.gov slash registrar for more information or chesterfield.gov gov slash bond for information on the plan. Gerard, thank you very much for joining us today. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. 
All right, now make sure you check us out on social media. On Twitter, it's at Chesterville VA. On Instagram, it's Chesterville Virginia, all one word. And on Facebook, you can search for our um, podcast page. Make sure you keep up with us as we go forward. Now, let me tell you about all the ways you can check us out. You can watch us on our YouTube channel at Chesterfield.gov slash, excuse me, on the YouTube channel as well as on our website at Chesterfield.gov slash podcast. And our only version of the show is available there as well as on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Overcast, and a whole host of other services. You can also watch the show on WCCT Thursday through Sunday at 7 and on the weekends at noon. That's Comcast Channel 98 and Verizon Channel 28. And lastly, you can check out Chesterfield.gov slash connect with us more ways for you to get in touch with us and for us to get in touch with you. My thanks to my director, Martin Stith, my executive producer, Susan Pollard, and all the good folks here in communications and media for making this possible. And my thanks to you for joining us today. So from all of us here in Chesterfield, thank you very much for making this a part of your day. We'll see you again real soon. Take good care. <laughs>